he was one of the five Istari. He was sent to Middle-earth for good reasons. He failed his task. But what did Saruman really do during his time on Middle-earth? Let's find that out today. Hello and welcome to The Broken Sword. Today we are looking at the full story of Saruman the Wizard. As one of the five Astari, Saruman is an ancient and powerful being, brought to life by the late, great Christopher Lee in the popular film trilogy by Peter Jackson. The character of Saruman has remained, of all times, an interest. When did he go wrong though? What was his original purpose? How powerful was he? Today we are going to try and answer each of those questions and look at the full story of Saruman the White or Saruman of many colours. We will go through looking at a number of accounts which illustrate the character of Saruman long before he was known by such a name. When the series was first published, the criticism of the tale being one of purely good versus purely evil was put forth, something we still see today. In response to this very idea though, Tolkien responded. Not that I have made even this issue quite so simple. There are Saruman and Denethor, and Boromir, and there are treacheries and strife even among the Orcs. This is one of the many times Tolkien spoke of his wizards in letters, to attempt to clarify some of their functions or powers. For example, also in letter 156 he explained, Of Gandalf, I would venture to say that he was an incarnate angel, strictly an angelos, that is, with the other Istari, Wizards, those who know, an emissary from the Lords of the West, sent to Middle-earth as the great crisis of Sauron loomed on the horizon. By incarnate, I mean they were embodied in physical bodies capable of pain and weariness, and of afflicting the spirit with physical fear and of being killed. Though supported by the angelic spirit, they might endure long, and only show slowly the wearing of care and labour. During the Second Age, Saruman was living as a Maya of Aule in Amman. We have no word on what his specific interests were, as Tolkien gives us no information. We can only imagine what he would do. Perhaps he was more focused on his works and enjoyed life as a privileged Maya. Though it is possible that, being of the same race of Sauron, he would have been curious about what this Lord of the Rings was doing as the Noldor and Sindar fled Middle-earth and began to arrive in Toleresia and Amman. When Sauron went to Numenor, we can only guess that, with the situation becoming an increasingly worrisome one for all of Valinor and Aldemar. We can suppose that had Saruman played an active role, it might have been mentioned, as the Valar were there as Eru Ilúvatar himself intervened. Afterwards is when we get more direct information on Saruman and his doings after Sauron began to rise again at the ending of the first millennium of the Third Age. At this point, the Valar decided they needed to help the free peoples of Middle-earth by way of sending emissaries in the matter of an angelic being representative of the Valar, the powers of the world. As Tolkien wrote of Gandalf being a messenger, we must consider that he intended the same for Saruman originally. But as we know from the appendices of the Lord of the Rings, Saruman began looking for the One Ring in the year 2851 of the Third Age, and we know that he did so to benefit himself. In the last book of the Silmarillion of the Rings of Power and the Third Age, the wizards are described as such. But afterwards, it was said among elves that they were messengers sent by the lords of the west to contest the power of Sauron, if he should arise again, and to move elves and men and all living things of good will to valiant deeds. In the likeness of men they appeared, old but vigorous, and they changed little with the years, and aged but slowly, though great cares lay on them, great wisdom they had, and many powers of mind and hand. Long they journeyed far and wide among elves and men, and held converse also with beasts and with birds, and the peoples of Middle-earth gave to them many names, for their true names they did not reveal. 
Chief among them were those whom the elves called Mithrandia and Curania, but men in the north named Gandalf and Saruman. Of these Curania was the eldest and came first, and after him came Mithrandia and Radagast. The others of the Astari who went into the east of Middle-earth and do not come into these tales. We learn more of the Astari from the unfinished tales of Numenor and Middle-earth part 4 chapter 2 the Astari. It is there we read that the word wizard is just a translation from the Quenya word Istar and the Sindarin Ithra, each functioning as a member of an order, claiming to possess and exhibiting eminent knowledge of the history and nature of the world. Tolkien writes, The translation, though suitable in its relation to wise and other ancient words of knowing, similar to that of Istar in Quenya, is not perhaps happy, since the Heron Istarion or Order of Wizards was quite distinct from the wizards and magicians of later legend. They belonged solely to the Third Age and then departed and none save maybe Alrond, Círdan and Galadriel discovered of what they were or whence they came. At an unknown time between the Second and Early Third Age, the Valar called a council to decide what is to be done about the growing threat of Sauron. The Valar, being the powers of the world, have decided to actively aid in the fight against Sauron, but know that they cannot do so using force, as the amount of damage caused the last time the Valar intervened had extreme consequences for Arda, sinking Beleriand and all to the west beneath the waves. Their alternative to force was to send Maiar into Middle-earth in physical bodies. In the Unfinished Tales we learn that Gandalf, known then as the spirit Olorin, is humbled and fearful of Sauron, whereas Karumo, Saruman's name at the time, was ready to take Sauron on and head the order from the beginning. He is a natural leader, and Gandalf refers to him in such a way in the Fellowship of the Ring. Emissaries they were from the Lords of the West, the Valar, who still took counsel for the governance of Middle-earth, and when the shadow of Sauron began to first stir again, took this means of resisting him. For with the consent of Eru they sent members of their own high order, but clad in bodies as of men, real and not fake but subject to the fears and pains and weariness of earth, able to hunger and thirst and to be slain, though because of their noble spirits they did not die, and aged only by the cares and labours of many long years. And this the Valar did, desiring to amend the errors of old, especially that they had attempted to guard and seclude the Aldar by their own might and glory fully revealed, whereas now their emissaries were forbidden to reveal themselves in forms of majesty, or to seek to rule the wills of men or elves by open display of power, but coming in shapes weak and humble, were bidden to advise and persuade men and elves to good, and to seek to unite in love and understanding all those whom Sauron, should he come again, would endeavour to dominate and corrupt. Of this order the number is unknown, but of those that came to the north of Middle-earth, where there was most hope, because of the remnant of the Dúnedain and of the Aldar that abode there. The chiefs were five. The first to come was one of noble mind and bearing, with raven hair and a fair voice, and he was clad in white. Great skill he had in works of hand, and he was regarded by well nigh all, even the Aldar, as the head of the order. Others there were also, two clad in sea blue and one of earthen brown, and the last one who seemed the least, less tall than the others, and in looks more aged, grey-haired and grey-clad and leaning on a staff. But Círdan, from their first meeting at the Grey Havens, divided in him the greatest spirit and the wisest, and he welcomed him with reverence, and he gave to his keeping the third ring, Narya the Red. For, he said, great labours and perils lie before you, and lest your task prove too great and wearisome, Take this ring for your aid and comfort. It was entrusted to me only to keep secret, and here upon the west shores it is idle, but I deem that in days ere long to come it should be in nobler hands than mine, that may wield it for the kindling of all hearts to courage. And the grey messenger took the ring, and kept it ever secret, yet the white messenger, who was skilled to uncover all secrets, after a time became aware of this gift and begrudged it, 
and it was the beginning of the hidden ill will that he bore to the Grey, which afterwards became a manifest. Now the White Messenger in later days became known among elves as Curania, the man of craft, in the tongues of northern men, Saruman, but that was after he returned from his many journeys and came into the realm of Gondor and there abode. This is actually an interesting point that I'd like to now bring up and really ask a question to you all, which I would love it if you left me a comment on, and that is, do you think that potentially in some ways it was Círdan's fault Saruman turned to evil? Do you think giving the Ring Naya to him is what set Saruman on his slippery slope to evil? Let me know in the comments below, either with a comment of, it was Círdan's fault or it was not Círdan's fault. I'd just be curious to see what you all think of this. But anyway, let's now carry on to the wanderings of Saruman. Little is known of Saruman's actions in the first 1,500 years that he dwelt in Middle-earth. All we have comes from the appendices of the Lord of the Rings, and it only tells us that he journeyed often to the east. This might be a hint that his continued search for power, or it could be a hint at his early dealings with the famously lost Blue Wizards. He journeyed often to and from the east, but after 1500 years of wandering, Saruman returned to the west. It is possible that he sought out the One Ring for himself at this time, as we know that he did come close. After the coronation of King Elisa, he and Gimli went into Orthanc and found the very necklace that once hung about Isildur's neck, which is hard to explain without Saruman's active pursuit and his dragging of Isildur's body out of the waters where he was felled at the fields of Gladden. His return to the east corresponds with the growing power of Sauron at Dol Guldur. Is this a coincidence? I think not. It is also possible that he was already working to undermine the work of Gandalf in his capacity as emissary of the Valar, sent to inspire hope and fortify the hearts of men against the coming of Sauron. Saruman did not see Sauron as a foe to be taken on, but as a rival to be supplanted. First of all, it is important to note that Saruman did not build Orthanc, the tower, or Isengard, the surrounding fortress and barrier walls. This great fortress was built by the Numenorians between 3320 and 3430 of the Second Age, when the Last Alliance was created. The keys to the Tower of Orthanc were given over to Saruman by Beren, the steward of Gondor in 2759 of the Third Age. At Isengard, Saruman would find one of the Lost Seeing Stones and take possession of the Palantir, keeping it secret for many years. It was at the crowning of Freilaf that Saruman appeared, bringing gifts and speaking great praise of the valour of the Rohirrim. All thought him a welcome guest. Soon after, he took up his abode in Isengard. For this, Beren, steward of Gondor, gave him leave, for Gondor still claimed Isengard as a fortress of its realm, and not part of Rohan. Beren also gave Saruman's keeping the keys of Orthanc, that tower no enemy had been able to harm or to enter. In this way, Saruman began to behave as a lord of men, for at first he held Isengard as a lieutenant of the steward and warden of the tower, but Freilaf was as glad as Beren to have this so, and to know that Isengard was in the hands of a strong friend. A friend he long seemed, and maybe in the beginning he was one in truth, though afterwards there was little doubt in men's minds that Saruman went to Isengard in hope to find the stone still there, and with the purpose of building up a power of his own. Certainly after the last White Council in 2953, his designs towards Rohan, though he hid it, were evil. He then took Isengard for his own and began to make it a place of guarded strength and fear, as though to rival Barad-dûr. His friends and servants he drew then from all who hated Gondor and Rohan, whether men or other creatures more evil. And we are also told along with this, the Rongil often warned Ecthelion not to put trust in Saruman the White in Isengard, but to welcome rather Gandalf the Grey. But there was little love between Denethor and Gandalf, and after the days of Ecthelion there was less welcome for the Grey Pilgrim in Minas Tirith. Therefore later, when all was made clear, many believed that Denethor, who was subtle in mind and looked further and deeper than other men of his day, had discovered who this stranger Thorongil in truth was, and suspected that he and Mithrandir designed to supplant him. 
Thorongil, of course, was a name Aragorn often took in his youth when adventuring in the lands of Rohan and Gondor. It is easy to see why, in this instance, he would be less trusting of such a suggestion despite its actual wisdom. In The Lord of the Rings, the history of the ring is revealed partially in the chapter of the Shadow of the Past, and further again then in the Council of Elrond within Rivendell. When Saruman is first mentioned in The Lord of the Rings, it is in this chapter. Who is he? asked Frodo. I have never heard of him before. Maybe not, answered Gandalf. Hobbits are, or were, no concern of his. Yet he is great amongst the wise. He is the chief of my order and head of the council. His knowledge is deep, but his pride has grown with it, and he takes ill any meddling. The law of the Alvin Rings, great and small, is his province. He has long studied it, seeking the lost secrets of their making. But when the rings were debated in the council, all that he would reveal to us of his ring law told against my fears. So my doubts slept, but uneasily. Still I watched and I waited. And all seemed well with Bilbo, and the years passed. Yes, they passed, and they seemed not to touch him. He showed no signs of age. The shadow fell on me again, but I said to myself, After all, he comes of a long-lived family on his mother's side. There is time yet. Wait. And I waited, until that night when he left this house. He said and did things then that filled me with a fear that no words of Saruman could allay. I knew at last that something dark and deadly was at work, and I have spent most of the years since then in finding out the truth of it. Much of the backstory given at the beginning of the films is given here, in the Council of Alrond, and by further explanation, Gandalf explains how Gollum travelled to Mordor and how Bilbo and the Shire's location were given up to the enemy. He further explains his encounter with Saruman, and how this meeting was used by Saruman to convince Gandalf to join him and Sauron. Gandalf refuses and is imprisoned, only to later escape with the help of the eagles. It is in Rivendell that Frodo learns the truth of Strider, the One Ring, and the importance of his mission that, to that point, he had not fully comprehended. Speaking at the council, we learn what Saruman said. A new power is rising. Against it, the old allies and policies will not avail us at all. There is no hope left in elves or dying Numenor. This then is one choice before you, before us. We may join with that power. It would be wise, Gandalf. There is hope that way. Its victory is at hand, and there will be rich reward for those that aided it. If we then proceed to the two towers, when Saruman's fighting Urukai and Sauron's orcs get into a fight. Merry and Pippin then flee into a forest, climb atop a hill and look for a better view. It is then when they meet Treebeard the End. Treebeard wants news of Gandalf, and reveals that he dislikes Saruman's recent activities. Treebeard tells them that though Saruman was once wise and learned, he turned away from the natural world and towards machines cross-breeding orcs and men to create the Urukai. Treebeard himself calls the Entmoot to deliberate what options they have to deal with Saruman, and after some deliberation, the Ents are off to war. From Orthanc, Saruman summons fire from the ground to burn the Ents alive, but they divert the river Aizen and drown out the flame, trapping Saruman in the Tower of Orthanc that was once his stronghold. Saruman appears in a rainbow-coloured robe and attempts to enchant the company, with Merry and Pippin now joined by Gandalf and Theoden who come to confront Saruman. They are warned against the power of Saruman's speech, as he has a magical ability with words. Saruman refuses to repent when given the chance, and Gandalf breaks his staff, so he cannot use his weapon any longer. After he removes his white robe and dons the robe of many colours, he forges his own rings of power. He refers to himself as Saruman the Wise, Saruman Ring Maker, and Saruman of Many Colours. In the film version, Saruman is admitted entirely from the theatrical cut of The Return of the King, but we do get to see him in the extended edition, a point to which Sir Christopher Lee very much was not happy himself. 
At the beginning of the film, he is holed up in Isengard, surrounded and trapped by the Ents and betrayed unto his death by Grima Wormtongue. This is not how his ending comes upon him in the books. After his armies are defeated at the Hornburg, or at Helm's Deep for you in Peter Jackson's films, the Ents are unable to actually do damage to the structure of Orthanc, built long ago by the might and majesty of the Numenorians. But Treebeard pities him, and so he lets him leave. This is where one of the most controversial cuts from the films does take place, the removal of the Scouring of the Shire, wherein Saruman, Fatty Bolger, and a group of thugs have done much the same to the Shire as they had done to the lands of Isengard, polluting its rivers and filling its skies with smoke. They discover that Saruman has hidden himself under the name Sharky, overseeing the destruction of the Shire and its Mari. Though his death is different in the book, his death comes all the same. In his last exchange with Wormtongue, Saruman accuses him of murder, which was something Saruman had actually forced Wormtongue into. This proves to be the breaking point for the despicable Wormtongue. He cuts Saruman's throat before he is taken down by a volley of hobbit archers. The description of his death is particularly gruesome. To the dismay of those that stood by, about the body of Saruman a grey mist gathered, and rising slowly to a great height like smoke from a fire, as a pale shrouded figure it loomed over the hill. For a moment it wavered, looking to the west, but out of the west came a cold wind, and it bent away, and with a sigh dissolved into nothing. Frodo looked down at the body with pity and horror, for as he looked it seemed that long years of death were suddenly revealed in it, and it shrank and the shriveled face became rags of skin upon a hideous skull. Lifting up the skirt of the dirty cloak that sprawled beside it, he covered it over and turned away. So there we have it, the end of the once potentially great wizard of Saruman. Saruman was a long-lived and powerful being. With all his power and wisdom, he was still liable to the follies of envy, pride and lust. Throughout the story of Saruman, over and over, we see his pride and hubris, his willingness to use force, and his rather loose moral compass. The hints we have of his eventual fate are many, but there is much to say about him as a literary creation. One of the criticisms of Tolkien in modern times is that his characters are either purely evil or purely good, while Saruman, though fully turned evil at his ending, was a being with a conflicted soul gifted great power but restrained in its usage, glimpsing Sauron's strength and being unable to contest it. This was something his pride would not allow, and like a disease, the slow rot came over his soul and drove him into his ruin. It is a mighty shame that an angelic being like that once of Kurinia, living life long before any of us could comprehend, and really proving he failed his mission. So with that now, it is time for my question of the day, which is, what do you think of Saruman? Do you believe that he was actually truly evil from the start? After all, he was another Maya of Aule, and some of the evil ones, in other words, Sauron, do seem to come from that path. Or was he never this at all, and it was all just a bit of a misunderstanding? Please let me know all of your thoughts and opinions on this in the comment section below. And now it is time to shout out our patrons. You guys are the ones letting us be able to make our own short film in the background of all things, and I cannot thank you all enough. Firstly, we have our Divine Power tier members of Kevin and Abram. You are both awesome. And a big thanks to our Fire Demon tier members of Nasheed, Denver Seal, and Gregory. You are amazing people. And as well, I cannot forget the Wizard Staff tier members of John, Andrew, and Jennifer. You are all true legends of the Bro Hero. Finally, if you have managed to reach the end of this video with me today and you are enjoying what you've seen, then please hit that subscribe button and the bell icon too with all notifications ticked so that you will know when all of our future videos go up. So one last thing to say thank you for all of you for spending just some time with me today and I will see you next time on The Broken Sword.